Bibles with this morning, Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter, verse number 22. Matthew chapter 14, starting verse number 22. Make our way to verse number 33 this morning. I'm going to speak to you this morning on what do you do when you find yourself in a predicament? Anybody in here ever been in a predicament? Let me tell you something. When you find yourself in a predicament, sometimes those things are kind of tricky. Uh, I, I found out that in life, some of the predicaments that I found myself in could be rather small. Uh, and then I found that some of those predicaments could be rather large. And so when you talk about a predicament, how, how would you describe a predicament? Well, I would describe a predicament as something that, that shocks you whether small or large, or something that kind of shapes your ground. So, so what I want to talk about this morning, what is it that we do when we find ourselves in a situation that we're totally shocked? I mean, when we face something that literally shapes our world, what do we do? See, what I found out is this. When we go through those moments in our life, when we go through those predicaments, it's on the backside of how we handle it that's the most important. It's not how we get through it or how we start into it, but it's on the backside of, of how we handle that moment when we realize, guess what? My world's just been shaken, and I'm shocked. I find myself in a predicament. What in the world do I do? Well, in this particular passage of Scripture, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, I think it hits the nail on the head. Look at what he says. In chapter 14, verse number 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go before him on the other side while he sent the multitude away. Verse 23. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up to the mountains apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, uh, spake unto them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind bolsterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, O oh, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Let us pray. Father, in these next few moments, as we dig through this passage of Scripture, as we pick it apart to see how you speak to us through those predicaments that we find ourselves in. Some small, some rather large. Even the small ones that shake our world. The large ones that shock us help us to see how vitally important it is for us to have a grip on how we're to respond once we realize we're in a predicament. I pray, Father, through the pages of Scripture this morning that you begin to speak to us. That you begin to speak to us plain and clear in such a way that we can go back and recall it to our memory. That we can go to this passage of Scripture and we can see it laid out for us, verse by verse. And I pray, Father, that it would have a lasting impression upon our hearts and lives. And in the next time that we find ourselves in something that shocks our system and rocks our world, that we'll be able to recall to mind exactly what we need to do. Take me now, your messenger, and speak through me the words that we, your people, stand in need of. For in the precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, this morning, I want you to, to look at the scripture. I want you to see four or five things, I think, that's in here that will help us understand what we need to do when we find ourselves with our world being shaken and 
or can I just shop? First is this. I think the scripture is plain that we must have faith and not fear. Look at verse 26. And they cried for fear. Cried out for fear. Now this is the disciples now who are crying out for fear. Look at verse 27. Be of good cheer. It is I, Jesus speaking to them, be not afraid. Verse number 30. But when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid. Speaking of Peter, verse 31. Jesus says, O of little faith, faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And so we must have this faith instead of fear. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can exempt ourselves from the uh, reality of life, and I'm not saying that you should not have regular, normal emotions and concerns when, uh, when uncertainty strikes, and especially when something that just shakes our world. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is this, that fear is not the spiritual response that God wants from his people. From you and I as God's people. Now, we may find ourselves in fear, but that's not the spiritual response that he wants us to have. No, he wants us to respond by having faith. Say Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse number 7. For God hath not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. You know what I found out about fear? Fear, fear will do this. Fear will not comfort one single person. I've never found it in my life to where I have been afraid, to where I have uh, exhibited fear in my life, to where I have been comforted by any means at all. You know what fear does? Fear brings about anxiety, and it brings about stress, and it brings on more anxiety, and it makes us even more stressful. And so fear never, ever, ever works. We must not let that fear reign in our hearts and lives, and we certainly must not allow it to reign when we find ourselves in a predicament where our world has been shaken. And so we have to check that box off. The answer is not fear. It's faith. Faith is the only way we can get our answers. For Jesus said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 22, have faith in God. Matter of fact, the Bible commands us to keep the faith, especially when our world comes caving in. I want to tell you something. It's not fun when your world comes caving in. You know what happens to most people when their world comes caving in? It's the time in their life where they give up on God and they respond in fear instead of faith and they run for fear to the hills. We run away from the Father. We run away from the one who is wanting us to run to him. And it was Jesus that told Peter in our text that he had little faith. Why is it that he said, hey, you have little faith? Look at what the scripture said. Because Peter looked at the storm in fear instead of looking at the storm in faith. He saw what was around him, the wind and the waves. And he forgot about who was standing in front of him which was the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I find myself in life where the Lord is just screaming at me, saying, stop looking at the storm. Stop looking at the predicament. Stop looking at the circumstance. Stop looking at all this stuff that is shaking your world and just keep your eyes focused on me. Now look at what Jesus said. From the beginning, when when, when when he saw, when, when Peter saw Jesus approaching him, walking over the water, he said, It is I, be not afraid. I mean, if, if there was any, emo, any moment in Peter's life when he should not be afraid, it's when Jesus walks up on the water and looks at Peter and he says, Hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. I know this is probably not a popular notion that I. I know it's definitely not politically correct to say, but I believe 100% that God takes those predicaments that we find ourselves in, little or small, to get our attention. To make us wake up. To make us take our eye off the storm and focus on Him. Yeah, you and I must stop looking at the storms. We must stop looking at the predicaments. And we must focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to have faith, not fear. 
Second thing we have to do is this. We have to pray and not panic. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. Yeah, when, when panic takes over, you know what happens? Prayer flees. When panic takes over in my life, I'm not the individual that when I do panic, I'm not down on my knees praying. That's the last thing on my mind is when I'm in panic mode to stop and say, hey, it's time for me to sit down and pray, get, get in my prayer closet with the Father. No, hey, I'm in panic mode. Yeah, Peter was looking to the Lord in faith. But when he panicked, guess what happened? He began to sink. The same thing that happened to Peter is the same thing that happens to me when I begin to panic. The same thing that will happen to you in your life. When you get in panic mode, you stop praying, and guess what happens? You begin to sink. But when he found, when, when, when he began to pray, guess what happened? He found that there was rescue on the horizon. When he found himself just starting to pray. You see, sometimes you and I must resist the urge to respond in panic and do everything by prayer and supplication, bringing it all to the Lord. Now, write this down. Every time you panic, you sink. So pray. And when you get tired of praying, pray some more. And when you get tired of praying some more, pray even more. And we're in difficult times in society, right? We're in, we're in difficult times in our world. The world just don't know it. <laughs> we're in difficult times in America. And I can tell you, America don't even realize it. <laughs> and if God's people, if you and I as God's people, do not rise to the occasion and begin to pray, I'm telling you something. Tomorrow looks real, real bleak. And the future looks even more bleak. If we don't rise to the occasion and stand up and start praying. Someone said to me that, Preacher, you really think that praying for America is going to help America? What else are we going to do? What else are we going to do? Panic doesn't work. But we have to pray. You see, the natural tendency of a man is to panic. I don't care how manly you are. Your natural tendency is to panic. It's not to fall down on your knees when you're in the middle of a predicament and start pouring your heart out to the Father saying, I, I trust you, Lord. I know, I know you, that you understand that. I, I don't know what's going on, but I trust that you do. It's the supernatural tendency of a supernatural man who realizes that he's in the middle of a predicament. And guess what? I'm not going to panic regardless. I'm going to pray. Psalm 91, 1. He that dwelleth in the secret places of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's hard to see in the shadows, you know. And sometimes the shadows are even scary. Yeah, I'm telling you, uh, I work at night, all right? And so uh, working at night, you have to have a um, what we call a tactical advantage uh, because anything we cut on at night to see by, you can see us, right? And so, uh, you know, I have this new little gadget that I can touch this little light and it lights up everything I see in front of me. I, don't have to, I can have my hands free and everything else. Uh, and it's great uh, until you or in a situation or predicament to where I want to see you, but I don't want you to see me. <laughs> and it's not real good, all right? So we try to keep all these little lights that flash and blink and everything else covered up and put them in night mode and everything else because there's, there's some times that, you know, I want to be seen and there's some times I don't want to be seen. And I, and I wish I could tell you that working at night, hey, it's a piece of cake, and, you know, every time I find myself in a situation, yeah, it's just, just another situation. But the truth of the matter is this. Even in those dark, shadowy places that sometimes we creep over into so that you can't see us, to get the tactical advantage, it's scary. I know you, you've heard that uh, all the calls and you hear police officers getting shot. My mom reminds me all the time, hey, you got your vest on tonight. I said, ma'am, I got my vest on tonight. You keep 
that thing on. I don't care if you go eat or what you do. You keep that vest on. Yes, ma'am. I got, I got the vest on. The vest only covers here. <laughs> you know, you, there's other places we can get shot, but we got the vest on. Uh, and so what you, you, we answer these calls that you, you know you, you guys get into arguments that we call domestic situations, and your neighbors call and you start yelling and real loud and stuff. And they call the police. Hey, they're over there yelling again. So we have to come up. And so we, we try to stay when we're coming up to your house where you can't see us, okay? Because when you're really mad at each other, for some reason you want to shoot at the police who one of you called, like, hey, my husband's doing it again or my wife's doing it again. And so we answer this call and, and, and you know, and we get a technical advantage and we're, we were doing really good and stuff. And, and so I, I'm the one in the front and I walk up to the door and put my ear up to the door to hear what's going on. There's a reason why we do that, by the way, because if we can hear you yelling for help, then we can kick your door off the hinges and come in and help you. Otherwise, we can't. It's your home, right? And so we listen from the shadows. And so we're in this situation. We've been there several times near the house. And as I lean in to listen, and I turn to say something toward the guy behind me, who's my partner. As I listen, I turn and the door opens and I'm face to face with the person. And she said, did my phone dial y'all? <laughs> uh, yeah. We just show up here quite often, you know, when you guys are yelling and screaming and everybody's calling. So the shadows, the shadows sometimes are scary places, okay? Unless you know whose shadow you are in. The psalmist says, when you're in the shadow of the Almighty, you don't have a reason to fear. Yeah, and so it's hard to see in the shadows. And sometimes they can be scary. But realize whose shadow it is. The third thing that I think we have to do uh, is learn to believe God and stop blaming God. No, we have to learn in the middle of our predicaments that I'm going to believe God instead of blame God. You know what I also found out is this. As human beings, we are good at blaming God for everything, right? And, and I had a preacher friend one time say, you know, I, I, can't, I can't figure out why, why is it that when something happens that people always just blame God? And I'm like, you, you can't figure that out? It's easy to figure out why we blame God. We're human beings, right? And as a human being, our natural tendency is to make ourselves feel better. And so what do we do? We assign blame to somebody else. <laughs> because if I take the blame, I can't feel good about myself, right? And so the natural tendency of a human being is that it's not going to be my fault. I'm about to assign the blame to somebody else. It happens in everyday life. If you're married, surely to goodness, one of the other spouses at some point in time, has assigned the blame to the other one. You hear things like this, not at my house, but at other homes, you hear things like this. Hey, you're not going to blame me for this this time. <laughs> we hear it from our kids. Hey, what are you blaming me for? It's your fault. We hear it from everybody else. Why? Because we're human beings. And our natural tendency is when something happens, it's not going to be my fault. I'm going to feel good about myself, so I'm going to blame you. And guess what? If Peter were like many Christians are today, including myself, he would have sunk under the water with a look on his face like, hey, I'm about to kill somebody because I'm the saint. Had that look on his face like, Lord, you mean to tell me you're going to stand there on the water knowing I'm sinking and not do anything about it? He would probably say, Lord, hey, I wouldn't be in this predicament if it wasn't your fault to start with. You sent us out in the middle of the sea. We're only being obedient to you. This is your fault. He didn't blame Jesus. You know what he did? He looked back at Jesus in faith and he believed. And you know what the problem
product of his belief was, it's found in verse 32 and 33, that everybody in the ship state was fortified and strengthened because of this. Hey, we live in a society to where we play the blame game. We live in a nation to where we play the blame game. We live in a world to where we play the blame game. And when you find yourself in a predicament, it's not time to blame God or anybody else, but to believe in faith. You have to stop blaming. It's not always somebody else's fault. I thought it kind of funny the other day when the headlines on one of the newspapers said uh, President Biden is now looking for 27 thousand vaccine doses that Trump misplaced. There's a lot of people that actually probably believe that. I'm not one that believes that President Trump carried 27 million doses of the vaccine around with him in his pockets and misplaced them somewhere, okay? And if they were misplaced, I'm pretty sure that one man didn't misplace them. Our government's pretty big now, by the way, a whole lot bigger than what we need. But it's so big that they get to play the blame game up there and they can blame for four years, eight years, and they'll just keep passing the blame. Because I promise you this, it's never going to be their fault. It's not. It's not our fault. It's not. We can do a better job, we're going to do a better job, but when we don't, it's not going to be our fault. It's whoever was in here before us. Why is that? Because, guys, we're living in a sin-cursed world. Yeah. And guess what? We're the sinners who cursed it. And because we've cursed and lived in a sin-cursed world, bad things happen. Somebody told me, uh, not too long ago, you know what? I get so tired of watching Christians get mad at God when things go wrong. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I get mad at God when things go wrong, too. I hate that when it happens. Not, I'm a human being just like you are. And I wish those times never came up. And they don't last long because I snap out of it. See, we live in a, a world that will read twist up our thinking. People that get mad at God, they think, you know what, I'm going to punish God now. <coughs> I'm mad at him. And I'm going to punish him. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn away from him, and guess what? I'm not going to go back to church. And we'll see how God likes that. Just a newsflash for you. There has never been and there never will be one person that walks on the face of this earth who will get mad at God and punish God by not coming back to church. It won't ever happen. You know who we punish when we do that? We know we shouldn't blame God. We know for a fact that we should believe. We know that God's not responsible for our circumstances. We know that God wants to save us from those circumstances. And get this, he will if we only believe. <coughs> and I know what you're thinking, well, preacher, I could believe if I only knew the reason why. Guess what? There's some things that we'll never, ever know why. It's okay. I can't tell you why, but I can tell you this. I can tell you the one who's in control, and I can tell you the one who's in charge, and I can tell you the one who can be believed every single time that we should never, ever. Respond instead of running. Respond. Don't 
trying to escape the fire. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But when we're in the fire and we stand the fire, guess what? It purifies us. Sometimes we run out of the fire too fast. Sometimes God wants us to stay in the fire just a little bit longer. And sometimes it's better for us just to stay in the fire a little longer. I like it when we stay in the fire. I hate the being in the middle of the fire, but I like it when we come out and we're purified. You know what happens when we stay in the fire and we get purified? It turns us into individuals like Peter who had enough courage to get out of the boat and go walk on the water. Everybody else in the boat did what everybody else would do. They hunkered down. You know what we call them today? A bunch of cowards. <laughs> Anybody can be a coward. Anybody can stay put. Anybody can hunker down, but not everybody would dare step out of the boat. You know why he stepped out of the boat? Because he knew that he had a job to do, and he knew that God wanted him to step out for a reason. And you and I have to, have to get to that point in our life where we say, you know what? I know that I'm in the middle of a predicament. I know that things are going wrong. I know that things are not like they're supposed to be. But you know what? I'm stepping out of the boat. I got a job to do. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's people that need to be saved. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's some anchors that need to be set. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's some life preservers that need to be cast out. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's some sails that need to be mended. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's some rudders that need to, to be steering. I'm stepping out of the boat. There's some opportunities out there, and I'm going to make a difference, and I'm going to step out of the boat. You'll never make a difference until you step out of the boat. You'll never help one single person unless you step out of the boat. And then the fifth and final thing that I say is this. We have to be assured we're not angry. We have to be assured that God always does the right thing. And we can be assured that God never makes mistakes. And we have to be sure that our anger is not directed at God, but directed at sin. <laughs> we must take the time to say, you know what? I understand that God's still on the throne. I understand that God is in control. And I rest in that sweet assurance that he's going to take care of me even in the middle of my predicament. So it's not time that we focus on our anger See what the scripture said? Peter got in trouble when he started looking at the storm. And when he looked at the Lord, he rose above his predicament, the storm. When in the waves, he was afraid and began to sink. And when he was assured, he believed with all of his heart. Jesus was going to help him. He rose above his predicament. See, we have a problem in that we always want to feel good. I, I'm going to tell you, I always want to feel good. I hate feeling bad. You, you want to feel good. I wonder they walked up to Tina when she was talking about being about 52 and hurting and all these things.
next time you find yourself in a predicament, might be today. There's some choices that have to be made. And if you can look at this passage of Scripture and grab a hold to what Jesus is saying through us and hold on to it, and guess what? At the end of that 